So I want to talk about some of the performance optimizations I had to do with the network traffic on this WebSocket game I've been kind of working on. So if you go over to the WebSocket event over here and I click messages, you'll see that every server tick, the server sends down uh, some amount of bytes and the UI has to basically update the player's state based on the game state that comes from the server. And also when the player runs around or like moves his mouse, you can see that we're also sending up. If I click on this and go to send, we can see that we're sending up byte information about when I move my mouse, when I try to click right to move right or left. And this used to be a lot larger than it is now. Basically every upload to the server is taking around like six to nine bytes, which is pretty good in my opinion. I think there's some room for improvement that we can actually prune that down even more. But also the events that come from the server, I spent a lot of time trying to really optimize this. So you can see sometimes it gets down to 50 bytes, sometimes 110 bytes. And this is dealing with a game that probably has like uh, 1300 entities. Every single thing you see in this game, like this tree or this torch, these are all entities. And anytime they change, we need to go ahead and broadcast that changed event to all the clients. And there's a couple of interesting things I had to do to make this performance. So I do want to kind of talk about them and diagram them for you. Okay, so originally we had a client here. And as you're walking around the game, the client has to send over events to the backend. And in order to achieve this, I was using socket IO. Okay. Now socket IO is pretty good if you just want to build something really simple, like you're not really caring too much about performance because when you emit an event with socket IO, you're basically sending over a giant stringified array or sorry, object of like stuff that's happening. So for example, if I want to send the velocity X or the velocity Y, you know, I might be sending this type of stuff. This basically corresponds to if W A S D is held down. We also have information about like the rotation angle. So like we could just do this and put um, some random rotation. And just by looking at this, this doesn't seem that large, but if you go and drop in the same structure into like a size calculator, you can see that a single event that tells the server like where the player is moving towards and their angle is 49 bytes. All right. And I was sending actually a lot more information. So every single game ticket was sending over like, I think a hundred or so bytes. And that was only one way, right? This is from the client to the server. The server had its own giant set of issues, right? So every game tick, which is I think happening like once every 50 milliseconds or something, we were sending in a giant object that had every single entity. So if I say entities, and you can assume every entity has like a type. So this might be like a zombie. It might have an entity ID. So I could say like, I don't know, some large arbitrary string or number. I'll just make it a number for now. But then also it has things like the X and then has like the Y and then it has like its current attack animation whatnot. So there's a lot of information that's basically being sent over to every single client. And the more users you have, the more data that you're sending. So this is a really basic example. Um, we could also put like an event ID here. So event ID, I'm gonna say like uh, a game state updated. So let's see how many bytes this is for just one entity. And I'm gonna go ahead and paste it in here. And it's 156 bytes. So if you can imagine you have a game that has, you know, 100 or 200 zombies all walking around, that can be very problematic. And now you're sending over like giant kilobytes. And not only is this an issue with the size of the payload that you're sending every second, but also to initialize all of these JSON objects in your game server and then send them over socket IO. And basically every game tick, you're making a bunch of new objects that are stringified and sent over, you end up using a ton of memory on the server and the garbage collection has to kick in, which causes the game to basically lock up for a little bit because the server has to spend a lot of time running that garbage collection. Now I was doing analytics and it only took like 30 to 40 milliseconds to do a garbage collection, even with this approach. But even with that, like you could see people's pings kind of shoot up temporarily and then drop back down because the server just couldn't process anything while it's doing the garbage collection. So again, this is my first naive prototype approach and I knew it wasn't gonna be performant from the get-go. So what I ended up doing is spending some time to refactor how we encode and decode these events or serialize or unserialize these from the client in the server. So instead of sending a giant object like this, I actually refactored the code base to use something called U WebSockets, which kind of binds into a lower level C library to make it really efficient to just send over byte arrays or buffers. Now, the reason this is good is because this allows you to have a lot more raw performance in control over how the data is sent over. So for example, instead of sending over a giant event ID called game state updated, you can actually have like an enum. So I can say like event uh, types, and then we can have just a giant um, event types like this. And then we'll say this is equal to one. Okay. And so we will basically in the game itself, we can encode it to a one, and then we'll put the one here at the very start of the message. So we know that this whole thing is going to be a game state updated. 
And so we encode the game state events basically like this. And the cool thing about this is you can actually use less bytes. So this thing is actually like a uint8. So it uses only eight bytes to encode the game state. And the reason this is better than this, because in order to encode a string, you're going to use a lot more bytes. But to just encode a one, technically you can fit that all in a uint8. And you can just put it right here inside of the byte buffer. Okay. Now moving on to the entities, we have to basically allow the client to figure out how to deserialize this. So what we do in the next spot is we put down how many entities were updated. So like, for example, if a game tick happens and 52 entities were updated, then we can just go ahead and put that in the byte array. And this one is going to be a uint16. So it's going to be a lot more efficient to store this versus having to store a giant array of nested objects. And so when this gets to the client, it basically starts parsing through this. We know we're going to have a uint8 for the uh, event type. And then we know that we're going to have the number of entities, so number of entities. And then we can start just looping over until we process all 52 entities. So encoding the entities is what would come next. And so what we do, again, is we put like a type here. And again, instead of saying zombie here, this could actually be like, I don't know, a five. So this is entity type five, and we know how to decode that, encode that from the server and uh, the client. And then since it's the five, it's a zombie type, we know that there's a certain length of bytes that can encode what needs to be on a zombie because different entities have different things on it. A zombie might have more properties than a survivor or a player. And so we know if it's an entity type of a five, we know that we should expect an entity ID, an X and a Y. In fact, I think I had this swapped. I'd probably even make this the, um, the entity ID. So we'll put this right here. This could be like entity ID of a uh, four, three, two ID. And this is so the client knows that like, Hey, if we don't have an entity in our current game that has four, three, two, we're going to make a new one. Right. And then we have this, which is the type. So this is the type of the entity. So a zombie player survivor. And again, this is used for the client to know, like, what do we need to generate on the front end so we can actually start updating this thing live. And again, this would be like a uint16 because I think there's only so many entities this game has and the type could be a uint8, all right? And then finally, we have like the encoding of the X and the Y, which technically you could use floats, but I found a way to basically clamp down those and round them down to just be uint16s. So like here could be an X and a Y, and that's going to be one, two, three. And this could be one, two, three as well. And these are uint16s. I basically, and I basically just round them down because like, from a client perspective, you have the canvas and like you can only render out like whole, whole numbers, right? So if you do lose some information about like the exact decimal position of where the entity is, it doesn't matter. Like, but you can basically just truncate a lot of this information on the float so you don't have to like waste all this extra space. So that's kind of how it works. And you basically just have all these encoded when there's a game state update. And then to calculate how much data you're going to need, you can just add these up. So it's 8 plus 16 plus 16 plus 8, uh, in this case, plus a 16 plus a 16 which eventually ends up being like 800. Like let's say I have 100 zombies. So 100 zombies, it equals like 800 bytes per game tick, which is much lower than the 600 kilobytes I mentioned over here, right? This is just one of the optimizations. There's a lot of other optimizations I did as well, which I won't dive into, but I'll kind of tease you with it in case I make a new video about it. So you don't have to send over every single entity every single time. You can do something called delta compression so that you only send over the entities that change. Sometimes zombies are standing still. So why would you need to send over the information about that zombie? Sometimes players are idle or they're not moving around. You don't need to send the information to everybody. So delta compression can help shave off a percentage of the bandwidth as well and kind of reduce this. Some other things that you can do is field level delta compression. So instead of sending over every single field every single time, you can actually find a way to dynamically add in a field if it changed. So sometimes an entity will have a bunch of information on it and it's really only used once to define the entity, but then it never needs to get sent again. And so what you can do is you can encode the field ID and dynamically add it in if there is a change in that field. Otherwise, you don't need to do that, right? But I'm not going to dive into that because that's a whole other thing that I do have in my code base. Um, but I had to basically weigh out like, was it worth adding in the field level delta compression? Because sometimes it would actually encode a bunch of overhead because you still have to describe like what field actually updated. And there are ways that I kind of reduce the size of that by using a bit set. So like if a field only has like less than 32 properties, you can actually have every single field be represented with like, you know, a binary system of a uint8. Knowing if these things change or not can be encoded in a binary number like this. So like, for example, if this number over here changed, we could say that, okay, the type has changed. Or if this one over here has changed, we know that the X has changed. And so again, we can use an uint8 to encode what has actually changed. 
And then over here, we know that, okay, if there's a 101, there's a different structure of this entity type that's going to be coming over. And we don't even need to worry about a why. Maybe it's just like the name of the player that got sent over or something like that. Now, like I said, there's a lot of optimizations I did in my game, which one of them, which I might even add in soon. Like if you have a player over here and they're in this giant map and there's a zombie over here, there's really no reason to send information from the server to the client for that player, right? They can't even see that far in the map. So why are you sending over that information about the entity? And of course you have many, many zombies that could live on the other side of the map, but the player's distance is far enough away that it's like, it doesn't make sense to even send this. So that's another type of optimization that I could do in my game. I don't actually have that yet. Um, but if you go and look at some of my events, like if I go to like server sent uh, events, we can look at a map event. And basically the way that I'm encoding this is every single event has a custom serialized to buffer and a deserialized from buffer method. So basically the server will create all these objects using this class definition. And then before it sends this to the client, it knows how to serialize the information onto a buffer. And then the client also reuses this shared code. Notice how this is in a shared folder over here. The client will reuse this class to deserialize it. Now this approach can be kind of manual and there are ways to like automate this. Like I mentioned, you can have like a field ID or a field type kind of already serialized on the deltas. But I, I feel like this is actually pretty good because you get a better understanding of like what's going on and what data is actually being written to the buffer. It's right here. It's pretty clear to understand. Now, just to kind of show you some code, because I do think it's important to kind of talk about the code here. So inside of the entity, this is the base entity used on the game server. It knows how to run through an entity and figure out what fields have changed. So for example, like I mentioned in the diagram over here, you'll see that there is a write uint 16 for the, the ID of the entity. There is a write int eight for the type of the entity. And then we kind of loop through and try to figure out what fields on this entity has changed. So like there's a, a serialized object that you can write things to, and I automatically track what field has become dirty or not. So we can then do further optimizations to know, is this entity changed? And if it is, then we'll send it over in the payload. And then, like I mentioned, we write how many fields have changed on this entity. Now, I will say on the entity, I am using field level deltas because it does end up saving a little bit of um, space. And you'll see that basically there is some optimizations I still need to do. Like I'm writing a string for the field name, which is not the best. Uh, it's better if you actually have this like a uint8, kind of like I talked about, or like a bit set. Um, but maybe I'll kind of go down that path soon. And then this allows for dynamic fields to be basically written to the buffer automatically and then decoded in the front end depending on the, the variable type. But there are also something called extensions. I'm trying to do like a component-based approach to the entities, and I loop over all the extensions. And so let me just load up an extension. Let's just go to like, I don't know, positionable. So these different entities are kind of built up of these extensions that define some logic that's basically shared between them all. So one is like, can this thing be positioned in the map? Then it has a positionable uh, extension. And this thing also has a serialized to buffer method where I basically have the extension type because I'm doing extension delta compression as well. I didn't really talk about that, but all these things have another section of like extensions that could potentially have changed or not. And I'm not doing field level deltas on there. I'm just doing like the full extension. Has it changed or not? And then I write in, for example, I write in the buffer of the position two, which is two int 16s. I write in the size of this thing, which is two um, u int eights. And basically, if this extension ever changes, I just serialize that information over. And if it hasn't, then I don't send it over. But yeah, this got a little bit crazy. There's still some more stuff I want to refactor to make it a little bit cleaner and a lot more efficient. Uh, whenever I'm sending over strings, that's probably a red flag. Like, I should not be sending over strings. There's probably a better way to encode this stuff. So I will fix that eventually. But overall, that's kind of how it all works. That's how I managed to shave off a ton of size from my events, which is important because the more players you have in your server, the more entities you have, the more data your server is going to be sending. And the client is actually going to have to spend time reading through that and running a bunch of logic to deserialize it. And the server spends a lot of time trying to serialize it, right? So you want to make sure that you're not just sending over giant JSON objects that are stringified every single time. That's a huge waste of uh, bandwidth. Instead, doing this type of approach, you can do it manually. There's probably a way to like automate your setup of your entities that make it all automated. Um, but this is the approach that I kind of took, and it's actually pretty good. I'm able to play the game. It feels pretty smooth when it's actually deployed to my VPS now, and it doesn't lag like it did uh, on the previous releases. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys want more over overviews of like performance tuning that I do in this game, uh, let me know. I think this is really good stuff to talk about. Yeah, have a good day, and happy coding.